Hello and welcome to Prism of the Past, a weekly series about historical events, people, and situations from the fascinating to the forgotten. I'm the Illuminati and today I wanted to talk about the legendary Shirley Temple, her life, her story, and what happened to her. Shirley Temple is an icon and I'm sure what many of us would think of when we hear the term old school child stars. However, many child actors are also known for later in life battles with addiction. So did Shirley fall into this category? Let's find out starting off with Shirley's introduction into the world of fame. And also before we get really into it, let me put a massive content warning here at the beginning of today's episode and just say that there was so much more child abuse and sexualization of kids in the script than I thought there would be. Obviously, I'm going to be condemning the actions, but if you might be uncomfortable with these topics, then this episode may not be the one for you. But anyway, let's begin. Shirley Temple was born in 1928, and at the young age of three, she landed a contract with Educational Pictures, making her acting debut in a string of low-budget movies dubbed Baby Burlesques. At age three and a half, she was enrolled in dance lessons and her father became her agent and financial advisor. The Baby Burlesques, as they often were called, were honestly quite questionable. These were basically short films that featured toddlers in eerily adult plots. For example, Shirley trades kisses for lollipops and says things like, I'm expensive in one called War Babies. There's also racist short films where the cannibals in a particular short were all portrayed by African-American children, according to one source. Charles Lamont, the director, was cruel to all of his young stars. Shirley Temple Black recorded in her autobiography that he kept a soundproof box with a block of ice in it and would threaten to confine naughty children within but he was perhaps cruelest to the young black actors. Lamont strung a tripwire across the set at shin level to the children playing the cannibals so they'd fall down more effectively when shot by arrows. I don't think I've ever allowed anyone to excuse this type of reasoning or anything before, and I generally don't think Shirley Temple knew much better, so I don't believe this should be held against her in any way. But in this case, she was also a victim, even though she was acting in these controversial films, she was again, literally three years old. I don't want to say that this is acceptable because they're not, but these were unfortunately normal for the time period. They're uncomfortable now, but they were normal then. After all, blackface and minstrel shows didn't really disappear from American stages until the early 1900s. So while it's infuriating that these black children were treated so poorly, I'm unfortunately not surprised either. You can even still find videos of this online and it's just incredibly creepy and there's no other way to say it. I guess I sort of always assumed that Shirley Temple acted in lighthearted silly skits reminded me of, you know, Little Orphan Annie vibe and animal crackers in my soup. Yet in more recent years, as we began to look back at the films like Poor Little Rich Girl, it's alarming how far from innocent these films actually get. She sings to her father in Poor Little Rich Girl singing, how I long to kiss you, marry me and let me be your wife while stroking her father's cheek. I'm all for a genuine father-daughter relationship, but this feels wrong. This doesn't feel, this doesn't, no, 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 no. YouTubers have also said there's some creepy incest undertones in the film, and honestly, I have to agree. In Curly Top, an adult male dreams about the young Shirley as he is described to be utterly bewitched by her, and in one of his dreams or visions, Shirley is nude. In that same movie, she's dressed in a swimsuit that is pretty apparently too small for her, rocking back and forth on a beach toy while the camera zooms in on her behind. I'm not even sure I wanna show this clip and I don't think I will because it's just the zoom ins and stuff, it's off-putting. It's so, so not okay. And in these clips that I'm describing, Shirley wasn't even 10 years old at the time. One YouTuber, Conspiracy411, continually compares Shirley Temple's films to Lolita and expresses the opinion that Lolita, a book and later a 1962 film about pedophilia, share many off-putting similarities. 
as the Boston Review puts it while discussing Shirley Temple dolls and movies, Shirley was the ultimate product, her managers capitalizing on the mania for cuteness. Combining the pert and powerless cuteness invited the beholder's responses on various levels, aesthetic delight, moral protection, and possessive desire. Children wanted both to have and to be Shirley. In addition to coveting the dolls and dresses, girls from Iowa to Bombay entered lookalike contests, but just what possessive desire did Shirley arouse in adults? The objects of her attention were almost invariably adult men. John F. Casson, a biographer that wrote about Shirley Temple, notes there was scarcely a male lap she did not climb into on or off screen, and there was an extravagant amount of manhandling in the films. He describes, for instance, a famous song and dance sequence in Stand Up and Cheer, 1934, that begins with Shirley's widowed father showcasing his glamorous fiance, exclaiming, baby, take a bow, and ends with the same exhortation to his diminutive daughter who emerges from between his legs, organza dress extending like a parasol from above her waist, barely covering her panties. In On the Good Ship Lollipop from Bright Eyes 1934, a plane load of hunky aviators pass Shirley up and down the aisle, each copping a handful of naked thigh as she goes. But no sooner has Casson reviewed these scenes of softcore kitty porn than he banishes the obvious inference that they might, just might, be designed to get a reaction from another part of the viewer's body than his heart. In the course of baby take a bow, eroticism has been supplanted by cuteness, Casson writes. The father-daughter bond is evidently sufficient protection from Shirley's flirtatiousness. Having tallied Shirley's lifters and caressers and bright eyes at at least 15 men, he calls this airborne orgy of intergenerational appreciation a celebration of childhood innocence, which contains an implicit contrast with a romantic adult alternative. Now, going into this script and beginning to research it and write it and all of that goodness, I kind of figured that, yeah, it was the 1930s. There was bound to be some incredibly off-color, off-putting humor and controversial scenes. I had no idea that it would be just a straight up like pedophile fuel thing. I'm sure there's some movies that are more questionable than others. So if Cassin wants to say that some are simply innocent and sweet films, fine, but there's absolutely a pattern of controversial behavior here involving the child star. According to another source, in the short Polly Ticks in Washington, a four-year-old Shirley Temple is seen playing what is insinuated as a prostitute. Sent to entertain a senator, played by a fellow child actor, Temple can be seen wearing a small bra while filing her nails in a manner meant to mimic the actions of a self-assured and perhaps world-weary mistress lounging in her boudoir. Temple later enters the office of the senator draped in pearls, sashaying into the room with her hands resting firmly on her hips in a disturbing display of mock adult sexuality. Temple then wraps her arms around the senator's neck and plants two clumsy kisses on the lips. Of course, the sexual implications are lost on the children who appear in the film, children who were simply following the directions of the adults controlling them, namely the film's director and he who discovered Shirley Temple, Charles Lamont. With the goal of lining pockets by turning a profit on the backs of children who had no way of advocating for themselves, Charles Lamont and his fellow co-conspirators at Educational Pictures helped to set a frightening precedent for the ways in which performers were treated in film for many years, at least until the invention of the Hayes Code. The Hayes Code or Motion Picture Production Code was released by major studios from the mid thirties to 1968. Of course, now there's the Screen Actors Guild and unions for actors that qualify. However, in these early days of Hollywood, it sounded like basically a free-for-all. However, these questionable scenes are what played out on the big screen. What about off-screen? Pedophilia in Hollywood has always been a massive issue. In 2011, Corey Feldman is famously quoted as saying, I can tell you the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. I was surrounded by them when I was 14 years old, literally surrounded, didn't even know it. It wasn't until I was old enough to realize what they were, what they wanted and what they were about and the types of people who were around me. They were like vultures. Shirley Temple, unfortunately, was no different. She wrote about her encounters in her autobiography called Child Star, according to one source. 
At 12 years old, Temple had already started to age out of commercial viability. After the box office failure of one movie in 1940, Fox dropped her contract. Eight months later, MGM signed her, but the movies she'd make with them were not hits. And there were other indignities. On her first visit to MGM, Mrs. Black wrote in her autobiography, the producer Arthur Freed unzipped his trousers and exposed himself to her, reports the Times. Being innocent of male anatomy, she responded by giggling and he threw her out of his office. Years later, another producer, David O. Selznick, literally chased her around the room expecting his do as her boss, Temple wrote. Coming around my side of the desk, he reached and took my hand in his. Glancing down, I saw the telltale stocking feet. She'd been warned to be careful if she found Selznick in stockings. Pulling free, I turned for the door, but even more quickly, he reached back over the edge of the desk and flicked a switch I had learned from Colby was a remote door locking device. I was trapped. Like the cartoon of Wolf and Piglet, once again, we circled and reversed directions around his furniture. Blessed with the agility of a young dancer and confronted by an amorous but overweight producer, I had little difficulty avoiding passionate clumsiness. Selznick is known for his work on Gone with the Wind, so he absolutely had access to many actors and many adult actors, and he seemingly believed he could simply do whatever he wanted with them. Temple said she was given the impression that casual sex was basically a condition of her employment, which is disgusting enough, even yet more disgusting when you consider she still was not 18 at the time. There's still more alarming incidents, even aside from this one. Not only were there threats of kidnapping and extortion apparently relatively common in her life, but one woman genuinely made an attempt to kill Shirley Temple in 1939 under the belief that her daughter's soul had somehow been possessed by Shirley. Obviously, she was swiftly stopped by security. And yet there's even more adult scenes she was exposed to. When Shirley Temple released her 1988 autobiography, one New York Times article mentioned that there was an attempted rape by yet another Hollywood producer, George Jessel. Yet infuriatingly, this New York Times article seems to criticize Shirley Temple for not being angrier about it and reads, where is her anger at an attempted rapes by George Jessel and David O. Selznick? Where is her resentment towards her first husband, Jack Agar's persistent brutish behavior and drunken Hollywood indiscretions? Mrs. Black tells her story, but she does not seem to feel it. The people in her early life are presented one dimensionally. Whether or not this writer actually liked the book, I think it's pretty scummy to question one's reaction to their own trauma. There are other sources that mention the abuse she suffered from George Jessel, as well as another producer, Samuel Engel, both of whom tried to force themselves on her. Yet I can't really recommend anyone go and read them. Multiple sources actually refer to the three of the four assailants as sickening Jews, or they call Hollywood a Jew-ridden cesspit. Yes, several of the men that assaulted Shirley were Jewish and many Jewish people involved in Hollywood during the 1930s. But to equate Judaism to these sickening acts is just plain anti-Semitic and fucked up. It's absolutely high key pissing me off for that reason. And I can find plenty of anti-Semitic sources out there calling this bullshit, but relatively few others. That's not to say that they're not out there, but there are some articles that do discuss this, but they're not really reputable. And they're typically blogs or compilations or lists as opposed to credited trustworthy sources calling these people out. Trying to find out more about these other cases, I bought the book online and searched the document for their names. When I looked up Arthur Freed to find the incident, she explicitly is quoted as mentioning earlier. That one shows up right away on page 322 and on 323, as does her experience with Selznick on page 352. I'm determined as hell though, if I do say so myself. And after scrolling through, I found on page 435, where Shirley distinctly says of George Jessel, quote, In one movement, he opened his trousers and with a sudden reach encircled me with one arm, his face droopy and baggy eyed looming directly into mine, but little could I do but thrust my right knee upward into his groin, end quote. Why is it that it's so clearly mentioned that Jessel tried to assault Shirley, yet so few sources seem to mention him? However, some people did speak out against Shirley Temple's films when she was young, though perhaps not in the best of ways. Another source states, 
In the early years after those shorts, she would rise to international fame in films like Little Miss Marker, Heidi, and The Little Princess. She was beloved, but not everyone felt comfortable with the way Hollywood capitalized on her youth. Graham Greene would flee the country after a libel suit followed his critical review of Wee Willie Winkle. Quote, the owners of a child star are like leaseholders. Their property diminishes in value every year. Time's chariot is at their back, before them acres of anonymity. Miss Shirley Temple's case though has a peculiar interest. Infancy is her disguise. Her appeal is more secret and more adult. Her admirers, middle-aged men and clergymen respond to her dubious coquetry. To the sight of her well-shaped and desirable little body packed with enormous vitality, only because the safety curtain of story and dialogue drops between their intelligence and their desire, end quote. Ultimately, a judge found in the studio's favor calling Green's review one of the most horrible libels that one could imagine. I agree that Green's review is really distasteful at the very least, and some have even called it slut shaming in recent years. However, I will say that I understand his intention was to suggest that, hey, Temple appeals to middle-aged men, and that's kind of weird. I'm not saying that no civil discussions were bad about Shirley Temple being sexualized around that time, but it really doesn't seem like there was enough of them considering how frequently this happened. Again, simply to present the other side of the argument here, one source that summarizes a couple biographies about Temple states, Neither author condones a few current critical impulses to reread Shirley Temple's films as sexualized or erotic. The authors maintain clearly that Temple films represented social purity, her main attraction. Both Casson and Hatch see Shirley Temple films as melting the hearts of hardened adults, usually men and often male relatives, and inspiring them to behave better and to adopt redeeming positive qualities, often saving their lives or their fortunes in the process. Shirley Temple's career in films was a metaphor for the redeeming of America amidst economic turmoil. This may be how the people felt about Temple at the time or even how some view her old works these days, but this isn't how Temple herself felt. And seriously, it just took me browsing through the autobiography to see how alarming her childhood was. Sometimes the problems were subtle, sometimes downright alarming and obvious. I don't really care how important it was at the time for people to be cheered up during an economic crisis. If it puts a child's well-being at stake, then it wasn't worth it. Plus, I'm pretty sure these middle-aged men should have been able to be inspired and behave better without, you know, sexualizing children. Unfortunately, in her late teenage years, things didn't get much better for Shirley. In 1943, 15 year old Temple met John Agar, an army air court sergeant who became an actor. Shirley Temple married him at age 17 on September 19, 1945, before 500 guests in an Episcopal ceremony at Wilshire Methodist Church in Los Angeles. According to Temple's autobiography, after vows were exchanged, things went from bad to worse. The handsome actor was a violent alcoholic who regularly abused his teenage wife, continually cheated on her, and was frequently arrested for drunk driving. John Agar was determined to badmouth her as the FBI launched a detailed background check when she was nominated for office by Richard Nixon, according to the Daily Mail. In 1949, Temple sued for divorce on the grounds of mental cruelty. As sort of a side here, it's also said that around this time, Shirley Temple lost the role of Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz to Judy Garland, another young woman who was treated pretty horribly by Hollywood and one that I do intend to cover in the coming weeks. Garland stated that Louis Mayer, MGM studio head, routinely fondled her left breast, telling her that she sang from the heart. And when confronted, Louis became upset and stated that he felt he was a father to her. So I guess Shirley was spared that assault, but I feel terrible for Judy Garland here, though her life is another episode entirely. It's also said that even with a 1939 California statute requiring families to establish trust funds for professional children, Shirley Temple's father squandered all but 44,000 of the more than $3 million his daughter earned. Despite this, Shirley Temple later in life hasn't seemed to hold any resentment for her parents, far from it. She said in a 1988 interview that they bathed her in love her entire life. And she said that, quote, my mother was, I think the most wonderful mother that a girl could have, end quote. She also clarified that her mother wasn't pushy, which is a relief to hear. As Shirley Temple grew up, her popularity waned. 
audiences struggled to accept that their Little Miss miracle was growing up, as one source puts it. And in the 40s, Shirley Temple didn't get nearly as many roles as she used to. 20th Century Fox didn't renew her contract in 1940. She took a bit of a break from movies and film historian David Thompson stated that she became an unremarkable teenager. And geez, I mean, how is someone that talented unremarkable? When she was about 21, not long after her divorce, Shirley Temple was engaged again and eventually remarried, finding true love with her second husband, Alden Black, who she stayed with for 55 years until he passed away in 2005. As so it happens, when Shirley Temple's marriage began, so did her new career, according to one source. As her husband needed to relocate to Washington DC for his career, perhaps it was a good time to make her exit. Though she'd given up acting, Temple wasn't done with the world of show business in its entirety. In the late 1950s, Temple became a host for the show Shirley Temple's Storybook, later renamed The Shirley Temple Show, which featured recreations of classic fairy tales by a variety of performers. Temple remained the host for three years and 41 episodes until the show ended in 1961. When Temple and her husband made the move to Washington DC, the New York Times said she became a prominent Republican fundraiser in addition to working as a television host on her show. This isn't all she did in the 60s either. She was also president of the Multiple Sclerosis Society and co-founder of the International Federation of Multiple Sclerosis Societies, where she raised funds to fight the disease that struck her brother, George. For many years, the Black family lived in the San Francisco area where Mrs. Black was active in civic and community affairs. She worked particularly hard for the development of the San Francisco International Film Festival, but quit the festival's executive committee in 1966 to protest a decision to show the Swedish film Night Games, which she called pornography for profit. By 1967, Temple's interest in politics had grown and she decided to run for Congress in California. As this was the 60s, this was no easy feat. Determined to become the first woman in the state's congressional delegation, Temple appealed to the public through press conferences and identified herself as a Republican independent. I think men are fine and here to stay, but I have a hunch it wouldn't hurt to have a woman's viewpoint expressed in that delegation of 38 men, the Associated Press via USA Today quotes Temple as having said. She continued, "'One Congresswoman among 38 congressmen is not unfair, fellows. Much to Temple's chagrin, she lost to Republican Pete McCloskey. Though Shirley Temple's fame can't be overstated, it's said that her photo hung in everywhere from J. Edgar Hoover's office to Anne Frank's hideaway. I'm relieved that after such an upbringing, she was able to pursue something that she felt passionate about. Shirley Temple, or Shirley Temple Black, as she's been called since she took her husband's last name, wasn't done with politics though. Though she lost to McCloskey, a more moderate Republican, she continued to pursue public service. As a side note, the New York Times speculated that she probably wasn't done any favors when the brands kept playing good ship lollipop at every campaign stop. She was representing the Federation for Sclerosis Societies in Prague on August 21st, 1968, when Soviet tanks rolled in and brought a premature end to Alexander Dubek's effort to remodel the communist system. It's said that this experience was harrowing for Shirley, and she describes the experience in her book as well as in a New York Times article in 1989 when she says, I was in Vienna in August, 1968 for a meeting of the International Federation of Multiple Sclerosis Societies, of which I was co-founder, and we wanted a 20th country to join, she said. They asked for a volunteer to go to Prague and get Czechoslovakia to do it, and my hand always goes up first. I got a visa and bought a one-way ticket to Prague on the train and got here on the 17th of August. She went on remembering how a delegation of journalists and officials escorted her to the Alcrin Hotel. Things went well and by August 20th, the Czechs were about to join. I was having a meeting with the rector of Charles University and at 4 p.m. a secretary came in and told me, your meeting with Mr. Dubeck in 15 minutes is canceled. He's all tied up. Those were the exact words. Unaware of what was happening, Mrs. Black said, she returned to the hotel where she gave a news conference that lasted, as those things do in this part of the world, for five hours. By the time she finished, it was too late for dinner and she went to bed. We have been invaded. At 11, I got a strange phone call from a gentleman speaking mostly Czech, she said. I understood airport and you must come down to lobby, and of course I didn't. At 10 minutes to midnight, I began hearing shelling, shooting, I think a bomb, but I thought it was a drill. It wasn't until the next day that my guide came back and told me, you will not see Mr. Dubeck and you will not leave from the airport today. 
We have been invaded. There were tears in her eyes. I was hungry and on the way up to the roof of the hotel to see what was happening. I took some of the leftover hard rolls from the breakfast trays people had put outside their rooms, she said. I looked down and saw tanks all around the hotel and their guns were pointing up. That night after curfew in the lobby looking out at the street, I saw a Czech middle-aged woman shaking her fist at the soldiers. She was shot in the stomach and went down. That was a bad sight. Nothing crushes freedom as substantially as a tank, she observed. She was here for the subdued anniversary observances marked by quiet demonstrations by a few thousand people and the police arrests of 350 of them. I wasn't officially accredited yet, so I took a two and a half hour walk near the park near the residence and told my staff where I could be contacted, she said. The article ends there, so I'm not sure if there's more, but I have to give a massive credit, of course, to Shirley Temple for going through this, telling her story and returning to the country later, and we'll discuss in a moment. Shortly after this, in 1969, she was appointed a delegate to the United Nations General Assembly by President Richard Nixon himself. It's said that she got her start when Henry Kissinger heard her discussing Namibia, a country in Southern Africa at a party, and he was surprised that she knew so much about the subject. Although initially some career diplomats were outraged that she was gaining so much recognition and appointed ambassador to Ghana in the early 70s, probably assuming it was because of her name only, State Department officials later conceded that her performance was outstanding. After all, she was so effective that she did truly silence her critics. One source states, Professor David Apter, a Ghana specialist at Yale University, described the nomination as a slap in the face and an insult to Ghana. In the New York Times, W.V. Shannon accused Ford of turning the field of American ambassadorships into a dumping ground for political allies. Yet soon after her December 1974 arrival in the West African state, which was led at the time by Colonel Ignatius Champong following a military coup, Temple Black was dazzling her hosts and silencing her critics at home. She has proved herself to be a capable, wonderful person who is determined to work for the good of others, wrote the Ghanaian Times. Mrs. Temple Black is a charming lady, a family woman, and an astute diplomat, and entirely deserves her appointment, said The Echo, another newspaper. So let's discuss it. What did Shirley Temple do in her ambassador work that was so effective as to silence her critics? Well, before we jump into that, let's just take a moment to thank today's sponsors. Hello, this episode is sponsored by me, and it's really just me putting in a little side announcement here to let you know that if I haven't officially done it yet, I am returning to streaming very soon, twitch.tv slash the Illuminati. Sometimes things are a little more lighthearted over there, and sometimes I cover just more current events that I just can't get to immediately within my own series of work. So if you want to check that out, again, twitch.tv slash the Illuminati, spelled just like my name all sorts of weirdness and that's where you're going to find me. I don't really have a set schedule, but I will be over there more frequently. Again, I'm going to try and stream at least eight times a month. That's the plan at least. And for those of you that may miss the streams or we're in totally different time zones when I'm streaming or whatnot, I have a second channel, which is called Illuminati with the last like T part being spelled T-E-A. And that's where I crop up and have like cut edited versions of those streams. So if you miss the streams and just want to catch up on the highlights, that's the channel to go to as well. Okay, back to the episode. Shirley Temple served as the ambassador to Ghana from December 1974 to 1976 under President Gerald R. Ford. According to Shirley Temple herself, I have no trouble being taken seriously as a woman and a diplomat here, she stated after arriving in Ghana. My only problems have been with Americans who, in the beginning, refused to believe I had grown up since my movies. Though the Ghanaian press in those days were apparently quite anti-American, Shirley Temple was the exception and she was highly well-respected there. She even made honorary chief in a village near Accra, Ghana's capital. According to one source, she delivered really effective messages about us Ghanaian relations, about whether the AIDS project or other commercial activities might be in that area to the regional governor and to his staff, but also wove in her happiness at the time she spent in Ghana, her love of the Ghanaian people, how much she respected Ghana. She was really very skillful. 
Also, beyond being just an effective ambassador, presenting her points effectively, she was skilled at relating to people and she really made the people she was talking to feel like she was taking them into her confidence, that they were her friends. She was very warm to them. She smiled easily and nicely. After her ambassadorship in Ghana, which ended in the 70s, Temple made history by becoming the first woman to hold the position of chief of protocol. It said that, when being sworn in, Temple told President Gerald R. Ford that it was a great honor to accept this position. Also while adding, I don't know why Mr. President, it took 200 years for one of us to get the job, but I will do all my very best work to try and fill all the various assorted sizes of shoes of the distinguished men who have been chief of protocol. And that she did. Ghana wasn't the only ambassador position Shirley held, however. From 1989 to 1992, under George H.W. Bush, she served as ambassador to Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Also, I just want to make a brief note here for anyone that may not know, Prague is the capital and largest city of the Czech Republic. I say this because multiple sources have explicitly stated that when she arrived in Prague as ambassador, a post usually reserved for career diplomats, she discovered that there had been a Shirley Temple fan club there 50 years earlier. Officials brought Shirley Ka old membership cards to autograph. Having been Shirley Temple was extremely helpful to Shirley Temple Black, she told reporters, mainly because it provides name identification. Although she added it had little bearing on whether I succeed or fail thereafter. I don't want anyone reading that and thinking, wait, was she ambassador to Prague or Czechoslovakia? If you were not aware, and I know from experience that some US viewers may not have had exactly the best education when it comes to geography, just saying, but there's far more information about this ambassadorship as it seems a lot more was happening at the time. For example, for months after she started, the Velvet Revolution began. Thankfully, because of her experience in 1986, when the Warsaw Pact countries invaded Czechoslovakia during the Prague Spring, this wasn't Shirley Temple Black's first time witnessing protests in the area. The Velvet Revolution of 1989 was a period where Czechoslovakia freed itself of communist control. It's also been called the Gentle Revolution since as the name suggests, it was nonviolent. As the ICNC or International Center of Nonviolent Conflict states, Only 11 days after the 17th of November, 1989, when riot police had beaten peacefully student demonstrators in Prague, the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia relinquished its power and allowed the single party state to collapse. By the 29th of December, 1989, the so-called Velvet Revolution led by the nonviolent coalition Civic Forum transform Vaclav Havel into a dissident playwright into the president of a democratic Czechoslovakia. The 17th of November event began as a communist sanctioned commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the martyrdom of Jan Opatl, a student murdered by Nazi occupation forces and a symbol of Czech resistance. After the official ceremony ended, protesters continued into downtown Prague toward the symbolic Wenceslas Square until confronted by riot police who began to beat them. Although the record remains murky, apparently one of the security force officers posing as a student demonstrator feigned martyrdom and a rumor spread that the police had killed one of the protesters, fanning the flames of outrage. Shirley Temple Black was there advocating for the revolution and change. And when the revolution was over, she became one of the architects of the relationship between the new Czechoslovakia and the United States. By all accounts, she acquitted herself well in the role. Charming final communist leader, Gustav Husak, who had been a fan of Shirley Ka's old films, but also maintained contacts with leading dissidents, including Václav Havel, whom she'd accompanied on his first trip back to the United States in 1990. According to journalist Jack Anderson, she insisted that the license plate on her car feature her initials just to annoy the Czech government. STB was the acronym for the Czech secret police. Shirley Temple represented US interests effectively during an extremely sensitive geopolitical environment, even if she was seen as just a child to some, supposedly taking away a position from an area expert. Shirley proved them wrong for that, and I have to give her incredible credit. Her tenure ended just as the country began to split into the Czech Republic and Slovakia in 1992. According to Black, after the revolution, her work shifted more to economic matters, though she did speak out against proposed laws barring ex-communists from government positions, comparing them to the Hollywood blacklist of the 1950s. 
She retired from politics after this as she was in her mid 60s at the time. It's also been said that despite her achievements in an age of male dominated diplomacy, Temple Black dismissed the notion that she was a feminist role model. While her appointments might have been a manifestation of the growing recognition that women have a creative constructive role to play, as she said in 1976, she preferred, quote, the strong arms of my husband around me to any woman's lib, end quote. Whether or not you agree with her there, I do think that she becomes an icon in her own right, not just for her movies. As for who Shirley was, aside from her impressive career, she was also an advocate for women with breast cancer. In 1972, Shirley was diagnosed with breast cancer and underwent a mastectomy, and in years later, she publicly discussed her surgery to educate women. One source reads, in an interview with McCall's Magazine via Windsor Public Library, Temple urged fellow women to perform breast self-examinations and admonished readers not to sit home and be afraid. Temple further explained her stance writing, the doctor can make the incision, I'll make the decision. By way of her empowering feature, Temple became the first public figure to write about her experience with cancer in a conventional women's magazine. The view around self-checks has changed in recent years as more evidence is gathered, but again, I give massive credit to Shirley Temple Black for speaking about her own experience publicly. Not only was she an excellent actress and ambassador, but a good mother as well. Her daughter, Lori, was addicted to heroin, and though Shirley and Lori had a troubled relationship, Shirley insisted that the entire family support Lori in therapy sessions and help her get clean. She was, and still is, an icon. Shirley Temple passed away at age 85 in 2014. There's a few reasons why I wanted to bring her up today though. The first was to bring light to the horrific acts of early Hollywood. Even though nostalgia is a powerful thing and we might look back on the old days as sort of an innocent thing through rosy lenses, we must remember that it's important that at least in this case, we can address the blatant issues that did go on at that time. Right now, the treatment of many stars like Britney Spears are being brought into the spotlight to show that this mass of critical and eerie sexualizing attention isn't okay. Shirley mercifully got out of the show business at a relatively young age and moved forward, but the events in her childhood stuck with her clearly as she wrote about them years later. The second reason was to simply celebrate Shirley Temple as a person and as someone who is more than just a child actor singing animal crackers in my soup. She was someone who was speaking out, proving naysayers wrong, and the achievements she had are well-deserved. Whether or not you agree with her views entirely, I can't really say there's a person that I agree with any of their views like 100%, but there is no denying her many, many lifelong accomplishments. So with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of Prism of the Past. I hope you learned something new and perhaps got to learn a little bit more about Shirley Temple and a whole other side of her adult life that I feel is just not talked about enough. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to stay up to date on even more episodes just like these, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay updated on all the latest episodes. And if you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to click on my Linktree link. It's in the description box, no matter whether you're listening to this at the YouTube channel or on the podcast format, it's right there. It's Linktree slash Illuminati, but the Linktree is like spelled weird or whatever, cause that's how the company does it. And that will have a list for all of my social media, like Twitter, Discord server, Twitch, Instagram, you name it, and all the other projects that I'm involved with. So thank you all so much for making it to another episode. I love you all and I will see you in the next one. Bye.